Sky. Hello and welcome to Writer Mother Monster. I'm your host, Lara Ehrlich, and tonight's guest is Caroline Haygood. Writer Mother Monster conversations are streamed live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and then released as an audio podcast on all major platforms. As always, please chat with us during the interview if you're watching live, and your comments will appear in our broadcast studio so we can weave them into our conversation. A special thanks to our sponsors and patrons who are listed on the Writer Mother Monster website at writermothermonster.com. Your support helps make this show possible. And if you enjoy the episode, please consider becoming a patron or patroness to help keep the podcast going. Now I'm excited to introduce Caroline. Caroline Haygood is an assistant professor of literature, writing, and publishing, and director of undergraduate writing at St. Francis College in Brooklyn. She is the author of the poetry books Lunatic Speaks and Making Maxine's Baby, the book-length essay Ways of Looking at a Woman, the novel Ghosts of America, a book-length essay Weird Girls, and her novel Filthy Creation, which is forthcoming in March 2023. Her work has appeared in publications like Creative Nonfiction, Lit Hub, The Kenyan Review, Hanging Loose, The Huffington Post, The Guardian, Salon, and Elle. Caroline lives in Brooklyn and has two kids ages six and nine. She describes writer motherhood in three words as hybrid effing monster. Now, please join me in welcoming Caroline. Hello. Hello. (laughs) Hi, it's so great to see you and have you on the show, Caroline. It's so great to be here. I love that very dramatic intro. I feel like I'm in a thriller movie, which is great. (laughs) There you go. That's exactly the vibe. Hybrid effing monster. Hybrid (laughs) effing monster. So start there. Tell us what what you mean by hybrid effing monster. Well, so first of all, I should mention that this is something I wrote a while ago. So I'm trying to even remember what headspace I was in. Um, But yeah, I mean, just this idea that, um, you know, you're a person. Um, and then you create this other person or people um, from your body. <laughs> um, and just like speaking of monsters and monstrosity, like, and 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 just to clarify one thing, when I say monster, I, I mean it in a loving way, right? Like I love monsters. It's a very positive thing for me. So I don't mean that motherhood is monstrous. Like it's just horrible, right? Although of course on certain days, right? It's not, not a perfect thing. Um, but this idea that from your body, you create these other people. It's so monstrous in, a, in the most wonderful way. Right. Um, And for me, like before I did it, it seemed really unbelievable and surreal and something I could never wrap my mind around. And then after I did it, it kind of remains that way. Like I thought it would just become like, oh, yeah, whatever. You know, I'm a mom. This happened and it's no longer surreal. But I do still look at them every day and I'm like, they came from me. It it happened. Um, And just that they grow and you watch them grow and they become these people who really aren't of you anymore. Um, And that's so strange, too. Oh, absolutely. The strangeness of growing like a brain and teeth and eyes in your body and oh then gosh. seeing them out in the world and yes. then this child who becomes their own human. It is very interesting and creepy sometimes it's when you so, think about it. Yes, yes, yeah. it is. It is. And I think my kids still find it kind of unbelievable, you know, because once they start to ask about the birds and the bees and you tell them what you're comfortable with and what yeah. they glean from what you're saying, the look on their face, right? Like it's, it's kind of amazing, you know, and they're like, but so I was in your belly, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it's the whole, it sounds like something, and speaking of being a writer, it sounds like something I made up. Um, and so I think when I first started telling, so my son's older, and I think when I first started telling him, I think that he looked at me a little bit like, is this one of your stories? Mm-hmm. You know, is this fact or fiction? And I was like, well, that's really interesting. You should ask because what's the difference? No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Definitely not like that. I was like, no, this is true. This is something that happened. But the fact that he would think that I think does indicate the incredible strangeness of this undertaking or really of, I guess, any life itself. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Yeah. My six-year-old asked probably a little early on how she got out of my belly. And I explained it, you know, in child friendly terms, but yet like you know, with the proper terminology and stuff. And she 
has since said, I want kids, but I want to adopt them because oh I gosh. don't want them to come out of my vagina. And I was like, well, it, fair enough. I mean, exactly. Right. Like, and I think that this is why we have the stork. Right. And like these, mm -hmm. these incredible tales that have been told um, because it is so incomprehensible. And of course, also because it's so anatomical um, and we're also uncomfortable talking about bodies. And then we originally that we, that we came from bodies and we about that. So the whole thing, I, I think that kids do really make you see the strangeness of things, the details of things that you, you know, had maybe glossed over. And this is one of the, those examples again, I would say. Oh, absolutely. And it seems like you and I share a fascination for that weirdness and for oh gosh, body, yes. uh, for finding ways to to write about bodies in ways that are raw and um, yes. true to life, but sometimes through slant uh, perspective. So yes. let's talk about bodies yes. in fiction or poetry yeah. or essays. Yeah. You've done all of those. So <laughs> let's talk about that. Yeah. Well, I, I just, I love to explore it like the body and language. Mm -hmm. um, because like you said, too, there's the way that, you know, language is constructed, and the body is constructed. Um, and I told you that, you know, the title Filthy Creation, my novel that's coming out is like, is a quote from Frankenstein. And I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, that book and, and that monster was sort of like one of my originating monsters, like one of the first, one of my first loves <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, I love how his, his body was, um, you know, Frankenstein's monster's body was kind of put together um, from these various corpses, from these various other bodies. Um, and was this very hybrid creature the same way that, you know, that text was very hybrid, right? It had letters, it had this, it had that. And so for me, the body in fiction, it's like, I love reading about that. And then I love seeing, especially because a lot of my work, it's like, you know, uh, poetic essay or, you know, like brings together different genres. Mm -hmm. And so I see that too as another way of kind of bringing together different bodies, you know, in, in writing. And yeah. so... To me, that's how I, I sort of got interested in all of, in bringing all these topics together was thinking like, well, how can I sew all these different bodies together to make, you know, a hybrid text to make like a monster? Yeah. And so that's how I sort of got into that idea. And then I also got into this idea of the art monster, which is something I'm sure that appeals to you given your entire show. Um, but this idea of like, how do we as mothers um, break out of the domesticity in order to get to that ferocious place of creativity, um, you know, where we're not, where we're sort of freed in that way. I love that you use the word <laughs> ferocious. And I think <laughs> often um, women who are ambitious and who desire and yes. who, um, who, who do a lot of th different things that are outside of the domestic sphere yeah. um, could be considered ferocious or monsters or monstrous, right? So yes. tell us a little bit about that ferocity and what yes. drives you in your work. Yeah. I mean, so I, I, so we spoke a little bit before the show began and everything was like, we're, we have a very, um, we have some parallels and overlaps in our, in our interests and passions, but it's, it's almost like, not only are women who do things out of the domestic space viewed that way, but I would say especially mothers, right? So to bring this kind of consideration. Um, and there's this idea that, and of course, everybody's written essays about this, which is what I was interested in when I wrote my book, as I read all those essays and then kind of grappled with them. But it's almost like, you know, so the idea that mothers should just take care of everybody else and that all of the time should go towards um, nurturing, um, and then anytime you take for your work is you're, you're sort of like stealing it from like your, your children, right. That, 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 that somehow, and, and there's this idea that the way you're doing it is somehow awful. Like you're like slamming the door in their face or something. You know what I mean? Which like, no, I'm very loving to my kids and very, I think I'm very sweet to them. Um, but there is this true tension. There is this true problem, especially if you spend a lot of time alone with your kids. Like, let's say your partner works a lot. And so you can't just slam the door on them and work like you have to, you know. And so I think, first of all, it's led me to do a lot of stuff around them, like a lot of writing with them and around them and try to integrate them. Like my son will be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to write too next to you. And I'm like, ha, it's part of my plan, um, <laughs> you know, so I can work. I can be creative around him. And I think he's starting to get excited by that. Or maybe he just has to because I'm just doing that a lot. Um, but I think also that 
you know, what it takes to be creative is very different than what it takes to make like Tupperware lunches. It's a very, very, very different piece of you. And so you have to kind of like find a way that, okay, well, they're with, you know, your partner, they're with whoever, they're safe, they're loved. And then you need to go into your, your little room and you need to blast your music and you need to get into this very different place because you can't be like, how's everybody doing? I hope everybody's cared for. I hope I have the right to exist. I hope I can take up space. No, you need to be like, I'm a motherfucking creator. <laughs> and that is completely the opposite of, is everybody okay? Did everyone get their Tupperware lunches? And so, and you have to be able to switch into that person sometimes because we only get these short stints to write anyway. So you have to be able to sw switch into that really quickly, do that, then come out and be like, how is everybody's Tupperware lunches? You know, like I will leave this meeting with you, this talk with you, and I will go and I will probably do something and that involves Tupperware. <laughs> Since everything involves Tupperware. Same, actually. <laughs> A lot of Tupperware. Yeah. And I think you articulated really beautifully that tension. Um, and I wonder about code switching. That's something I think about a lot, yes. um, as I'm sure many of our listeners do, that that code switching between work and family and oh family God. and writing and writing and work and all of those things that compete for attention. Yes. So and often, like you say, we only have a short uh, period or a small slice of time for the writing. Yes. So we have to code switch pretty quickly to be able to capitalize on that short period of time. Have you found any tricks for code switching? Do you have like a, I don't know, like a special rock you hold to get you into the writing mood or something? I'm, I'm like ridiculous. So I have like, my hair has to be up. I have to be playing like really, that's why I talked about like your intro music, like mm -hmm. that kind of music where, you know, you feel like you're in a thriller or, you know, you feel like you're about to like, there's like murder around you is like sometimes important because it's, it's the complete opposite of what your life really is like, um, you know, and then I have like, you know, pictures of writers that I admire, you know, all over. And I would just look at them and just be like, well, um, I don't think they'd be worrying about whether they had talent when they're five minutes they have to write, they just be writing, you know? So like, I, I have like a thousand things that kind of like get me into that mode every time I slip out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but the truth is like, it's, it's, it's such a tenuous thing and it's such a magical place to get into. And it is really difficult to do. Um, and so I, I don't know that there's any sort of perfect way of doing it, but I actually believe that since I now only have like half an hour of free time a day, um, versus when I, back when I was young and oh my God, it was like forever. I almost feel like I can switch into it because I sort of know if I don't write during this time and I don't get into that place, it will not happen. And I will only be the Tupperware person. And I don't only want to be the Tupperware person. And I think also we code switch too if we have jobs outside of the homes as outside of the home as well. So it's like codes like I, you know, I'm a professor and I teach, and that that's a whole other kind of self that's still different from my writing self. So I feel like there's three of me every day, mm -hmm. you know, and I wish that I could just, you know, um, make three separate versions of me and have them, you know, send them off into the world to do these things um, and take all the time, you know, for each of those three roles but it's sort of it's not how it works what about you what do you do this this i'm selfish about i really love to hear people's secrets on this i know well that's why i asked you for yours because i am still trying to figure it's that like out gold. i mentioned rocks because i have like all these yes. little like rocks talismans and, like, talismans yes, yes i'm I so love into them. talismans i'm like pretty <laughs> much a too. witch like literally i'm like i have like i if i had a cauldron i would use it Oh, no, same. Like, if you saw this room, it's full of rocks and journals yes. and yes. weird pictures and things yes. that are yes. um, that that connect to the work, I think, oh that, God, that yes. I that I am aiming for. So whether or not it's the work I'm actually committing to the page, it's work I aspire to. So sort of yes. like your pictures of authors yes. that you admire. It's, um, you know, a postcard of, of this beautiful, strange scene that speaks to me on some creative level. So talismans, I guess, are really important. Totally. And I always, I always joke that like before people come over, I always like, I usually have to move things around a little if they're going to come in here. Right. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't look like a serial killer's like murder board in here, you know, because I do think like the writer's inspiration bulletin board is first of all, very, as you said, it's very evocative and it's very beautiful and it's very powerful. 
but it's like also really strange to people who are not writers. Like they come in and they're like, oh, what happens in here? You know what I mean? Like you can just tell that they're like, um, you know, uh, so, but absolutely with the talismans and, and I do, mm -hmm. I think, I think that you're sort of asking for something to visit you or you're asking to sort of um, ascend to be something that's really greater than who you actually are, you know, mm -hmm. when you write, because the thing is, if I were to just write in my journal, it's one thing, but I'm trying to create something that's going to, that's going to reach out and grab people in a certain way. And I may not be where I want to be in my craft yet. And I might think that it takes 50 more years and, you know, for me to read a thousand more books and I wish that I could, but I don't have time to think that I have to act as though I already am that writer when I'm writing or why would I write? Do you know what I mean? Like I have yeah. to be a writer who's greater than who I am now and hope that something like a lightning strikes me or something while I write and it becomes true. And so I think it is that like fake it till you make it. You're like, well, I'm just going to act like an eccentric genius in my study for this half hour. And hopefully like I will read this writing later and be like, okay, well, this is something that actually is amazing. And you know how often that actually happens? I don't know. And maybe I'm still waiting on that, but I will wait on that forever. Yeah. I mean, I you think know? you put your finger on it. It's the self-deception we have to practice as creatives or else, like you said, you wouldn't be able to put to to even make a mark on a page if you're so concerned about totally. uh, your ability to do so. So it's kind of like, yes, totally. I am, as you said, a motherfucking monster writing exactly. monster. And I'm going to, you know, show the world. You kind and of then, have to do yeah. that. And even mm -hmm. before you like speak, like before I came on the show or before I go teach or before I give a reading, like I kind of have to be someone I'm not too, in the sense of not that I'm like pretending, but you know, like we're all shy, you know, and then to, to come and even like put yourself in front of people like this or, or even just for me to go teach every day, it's like, it takes a certain, I have to get into a mindset that isn't completely who I am when I just wake up in the morning. And we were talking about vulnerability before the show together mm -hmm. secretly and you know it's like you you can't be a thousand percent vulnerable and then go have the and then go do the kind of career that we do where we're constantly exposing ourselves it's just like constant mm -hmm. um and so there needs to be some kind of you know greater self that gets called on or something absolutely yeah some sort of self-protection because there is so much rejection absolutely. and criticism and oh my god you know so you kind of have yeah. to believe that anyone who criticizes you is uh, a loser and doesn't know what they're talking about at yeah. least while you're you know working or oh my gosh never produce anything yeah yes and i re and i read these interviews with writers who are like well i never read the reviews and they just like they sort of act like you know they don't care at all and they're so above it and it's not how I am and I internalize things. And so it really does take this like, you know, this incredible like extra bravery that you have to like put on like a dress, you know, and, and wear mm -hmm. um, until it becomes more real. And I think over the years it does become more and more real. You I know, think I think so I too. have, you know, like I think I have become like truly braver from being like, I'm brave enough to do this and just doing it enough times. Absolutely. You know, how does that, so as we're talking through this, it makes me reflect a little bit on the mothering side and how in mothering too, it's oh making God. it how you make it. Oh my God. Like who knew how to do no. any of that? Like, totally. who, and also it's, and I think people think of it, it's very like procedural or something like, well, you can learn to make, you know, to, I don't know what, like whatever the things are, like dress your kid and you can learn to feed them. But it's like, no, you need to be able to be loving um, in the hardest, hardest moments of your life, even and when they get older, like wh while they're saying mean things to you also at times, right? Or, or whatever it is, while they're sick, while you're sick, while the world is falling apart. Well, you know what I mean? It's like, it's this bigger existential thing, you know, that I, that I think um, you have to learn how to do. And again, like you said, it's stepping into this like body that's way bigger than you are mm -hmm. um, and, and trying to inhabit it. Um, and it, and it is like, it is like this play acting thing, you know, where like, at first I was like, you know, like talking the way maybe my mom talked, or maybe the way I'd heard other moms talk outside or, you know, because I just had no idea what this mother, what this mother person was. And in a lot of ways, I think, you know, still, who is she, right? It's this completely shifting thing all the time. And people do it in such different ways, mm -hmm. you know, outside of Brooklyn, right? In Brooklyn, everyone mothers the same. If you go to the playground, it's like the exact same thing. Everyone's <laughs> like, um, you know, 
uh, how does that make you feel? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, same. <laughs> And kids are just different, sort of like different people every stage of the way too. So it's like, as soon as you feel like you've figured out how to be a mother to this child, they're suddenly a different child. And you're like, well, how do I be a mother to that child? It's right. It's, it's a moving target. Absolutely. Can you think of a time um, that you're willing to share with us where you had (laughs) to kind of fake it till you made it with one of your kids? Like, was there a difficult period where you had to be that loving, supportive mom, even while you were like, oh, God, <laughs> please, yeah. someone take this child. <laughs> oh, I mean, I I don't know if this is appropriate to say. I feel like every single day, it's like yeah. every single day, because, you know, the thing is, um, and I have terrific children, but like the more that they're, the more complicated they are, the more complicated, the, the more like, I don't know how to explain it, the more high their highs are and more wonderful their wonderful is. But I believe like often the more difficult they can be, you know? And it's it's a thing I said before about how like, you know, all right, if they're not your kids and someone's talking to you a certain way, let's say, let's say at work, right? Let's say in a professional setting, like you would walk away, <laughs> like you would disengage, you would not, you know what I mean? You wouldn't stand for it. And obviously with your kids, you you know, you correct them, you tell them how to speak to you. You don't just like whatever, you're not just letting them, you know, but you're putting up with things that you wouldn't normally. And no matter what they do to you, you're still their like mama, right? Like, and it's funny to say as they're getting older and like, they don't even call you that anymore, but it's like, you always will be like mama. And so even if they're saying mean things and pushing you away, you have to simultaneously keep holding on to them, even while they are pushing you away while simultaneously giving them what space they need. Mm -hmm. And it's an almost impossible posture. Like how do you, someone's pushing you away, but you're holding on and letting them know you're still there, but you're still giving them some space to still be their own person. Um, And sometimes they're pushing you away in ways that are very hurtful. Mm -hmm. Um, And you have to not be like, never mind, I'm done. Right. Which you might feel maybe maybe there's like one second of every day where you feel like, never mind, I'm done. And some of it's just because you didn't want to wake up at, at five o'clock. Some of it's stupid reasonings. Right. And you might be like, never mind, I'm done. You know, <laughs> like dramatic, ridiculous. But it's five o'clock. There's no never mind, I'm done. It's they, they need you. They had a bad dream or they're, whatever it is like you're getting up. So it's like I feel like at least once a day. There's something with my kids that I feel like I cannot handle that I would not handle for anyone else that I must handle. Mm hmm. I yeah. know. Yeah. And I think that speaking of like stretching your skin, like speaking of, you know, and I think every time that happens, my skin stretches a little more and I mean, now, in a literal ways. Cause we all know about like stretch marks. So I'm kidding, but like, no, but like metaphorically speaking, right. Like I, I feel myself having to um, grow into something that I am not yet. Um, and I yeah. feel like it happens daily. Um, yeah. That's sort of um, a beautiful way <laughs> of (laughs) there's lots of great moments too right there's lots of great moments and they enable you to do those moments I feel like they feed those moments but there are a lot of hard hard moments to mothering and it's like if we don't and fathering but of course we can't you know we can't speak to that but if we don't acknowledge that then like where's the honesty in the show you know oh absolutely yeah yeah no you're right but it's wonderful to think of it as an opportunity for growth which I feel like like is what people say when something's awful and you just have to grin and bear it right it's like it's a growth opportunity oh my god oh my god that whole thing how it's like a teacher it's a lesson it's like it's so corny but it's like you know I am a teacher so that idea does appeal to me and do I think I honestly feel like it's half bullshit and half very wise Mm -hmm. you know to say that right like half of it is like really it's like said by that mother that you think has never gotten angry in her life that you don't understand you know and then the other half of it is is brilliant actually Like to be able to say like, you know, no COVID, no, you know, um, uh, this, you know, this long line, uh, the difficult things my children say, whatever the difficulty, whatever the, however traumatic, however difficult to be able to view that. And I don't think it's always possible, by the way, but to be able to view those things from the smallest thing to the largest trauma, to be able to view those as teachers um, and lessons would be like, I don't know, like Buddhist enlightenment, right? And I'm not there but I love the idea. And there have actually been times when I'm like about to lose it. You know what I mean? Like about to cry or about to scream or whatever with around my kids. And I actually have that thought where I'm like, well, wait a second. What if this is a learning 
opportunity and as corny as it sounds, but like in a real way, like what if, what if this is actually something I can, you know, we talked about going to the different head spaces of like, I'm going to go in and I'm my writing and be a writer. It's like, what if I step out of this place where I'm about to like lose my, lose my mind um, and get hysterical in some way. I don't like that term, but to like, whatever, to freak out. And what if instead I calmed the, I calmed down a lot and I saw this in a different way. And I actually had a really different interaction with my kid than I was about to. And I'm not always that big enough to do that, but the times that I have, it is transcendent. Yeah. You know, it's not always possible because like, we're not, because I'm not, you know, because I'm not a saint. Yeah, you're human. <laughs> totally. I was about to say, it's also I'm all okay. too human. <laughs> it's also but, okay if we do lose it sometimes because we're only human and we're learning yeah, Thank too, you for and, saying that though. I try to yeah. tell myself, I'm like, well, they, it's good for them to see that you're human sometimes. I think know? so. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. As long as they feel safe, right? Which, yeah. you know. <laughs> exactly. And they do. But, I mean, yeah. they do. Like, please. I'm like, look at me. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm like, of course. like, it's like what, you know, I mean, it's like the worst I do. Actually, I'm, I'm probably more prone to cry when I'm upset than to like say scream horribly. But mm -hmm. that's its own thing, right? Like, how much should you cry around your kid? Right? Oh, yeah. But I also cry for happy things. You see, they're very used to this with me because they'll be like, like they'll do something sweet or they'll graduate from a class or whatever it is. And I'm like, <laughs> and they're like, it's happy tears, right? Mom, it's your happy tears. And I'm like, yes, it's my happy tears. So first of all, they're used to the fact that I'm like, <laughs> that it clearly doesn't take a lot to make me cry. Um, but yes, I try to keep the sorrowful crying or the frustrated crying to a minimum around my kids because yes, I, I am supposed to be the adult. And then I'll like go into the bathroom and like have a good, you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <The> bedroom, <wherever. laughs> Did you always want to be a mother? I, you know, I think I did in a kind of like in the back of my mind sort of way. Um, because I think, so I think I've always been, I don't know how to explain it, kind of like someone who mothered everybody, like little, little bit maternal. Um, my mom actually raised me very, like she had me late and she was very like, don't have kids until you've done everything you want to do creatively and in your career and like very like that. So I had sort of the opposite, I think, of what most people have in a mom and in ways that are really, I think, really interesting, where instead of like pressuring me ever to be domestic, she was almost cautioning me against it. Mm -hmm which is like really interesting, I, I think, because it's my friends didn't have that, you know, where like she was never pressuring about, you know, grandkids or any of that. Um, but I think, well, like I had like a name picked out for my girl since I was like 13. So I guess, yes, on some level, on some level, I think I thought, but I still think it was like a, a potential concept. I don't think it was like a a done deal. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, did your mom, did she have creative aspirations that she had to put on hold for motherhood? She, she did. She did. And actually, well, so I feel like both my parents are actually like talented writers who never sort of um, like, I don't know, like did the whole full publication thing, um, which I'm actually still encouraging um, them both to do. <laughs> I'm like that person who like is constantly the annoying person who's always like, you should try to publish it. You should send out to, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like if people are like, I have no interest in being a writing, a writer, like stop. And I'm like, why don't you make it into a book? Like every five seconds. So well, it's hard. I it, this is a, a sort of tangent, but it is hard to imagine that people might just want to be creative for their own like in enjoyment. Oh my I gosh. I don't understand it either. I have the same impulse to put it out in the world and I don't but it's get people so, who just it, it is but it's so pure like it it's actually so great like so I always recommend um the artist way to everybody to mm -hmm. everyone in my life who like is is basically saying I want to be creative and I want to write but I but it's not about publishing uh -huh. you know I, I I often will say to them like oh you should check I mean there's there's things about that book that are that are that I like warn them ahead like oh sometimes it sounds religious or I say some I stuff like that to them um but you're right. I think there's this, you know, ambition and desire to be seen that's connected, that, that separates writers who more want to write in their journal mm -hmm. from writers who um, would come on a show like this. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, literally, my face is on the screen. Right? Like, <laughs> and, and I think it's also really interesting with writers because I think it's rare to find one who isn't at least some big chunk introverted as well. Yeah. Um, at least for me, it's like this incredibly painful struggle because I'm so shy and I'm so outgoing and they're both 100% true about me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so figuring out how to 
kind of like navigate that as a writer and as some, and, the, and then there's the business of writing, right? Which includes like interviews and readings. And that's what people don't think about when they're like, I want to be a writer or being a professor often goes with like, whatever it is. It's like you, like if I, if you had told me as somebody who was like shy giving presentations in college that my whole life would involve standing in front of people on some level, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I would have never believed you. And yet here we are. But obviously, like, there's some part of me, because I didn't have to do this. So there's obviously some part of me that's pulled to it, magnetically pulled to that, you know, at the same time that, like, I will get physically ill before I go and present still. Yeah. You know, like, I will get, like, the kind of butterflies that are, like, you know, make you feel like you're going to throw up. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, what about you? Like, do you do you have that introverted aspect Oh, absolutely. I mean, because yeah, you do the show, which is very brave. I do the show, but yeah. in part because I can, the focus is on you. Yes. <laughs> on the I see, I'm writing. turning it back to you. Sorry. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. It's okay. It's a conversation. Yeah. But yeah, and I've become a lot more comfortable with this type of thing, I think because of the pandemic, honestly, like yes. needing to be in front of people on a screen and to see, be confronted with your own face and your expressions and the things that are just horrifying when you oh. have to look at them um, has kind of dulled that a little bit for me. But yeah, I'm very introverted. I don't like talking about myself. And yet with writing, I will write something very vulnerable and and bold and totally not like myself and I want it out there published yes. I want people to read it so what is that duality I hear you on that that push and pull and I always make the joke like really way too often because I've always been published by independent presses right uh, yeah. that like the safest place to hide something is in an independent press book, right? Because like, who, you know what I mean? Because it's not, and, and also really in a book period, because what I find is that, you know, you'll have a lot of like kind people in your life who might, who might, actually not a lot, sorry. You'll have a very small amount of kind people in your life who'll be like, oh, you publish a book and like they'll, and they'll, they'll purchase it and they might like put it in their bookshelf. And that alone is like, you know, those people are speaking of saints, like those people are saints and you're just like, oh my God, thank you. You know? Um, but then like, how often does, you know, how often do they necessarily read it or how often do they necessarily read the whole thing or whatever? So I just feel like if you put something in the end of a book, let's say, it's like the purloined letter. Right? It's like the best place, you know, to, to, to put a secret um, in a weird way. But the people who actually take the time to read it, like, haven't they also earned that secret? Um, yes. you know, because they, they actually read it, I, I, which I think in this day and age of distraction and also how many books we all have and want to read and have in our TBR or whatever, I think reading a whole book of someone's is like the, the biggest commitment you can have, like, b like beyond marriage. <laughs> it's, yeah. like, it's like, I'm kidding, but it's like, that's really, you know, I think there are probably like husbands and wives who don't read each other's stuff. Like people are so <laughs> you know, busy these yeah. days and cutthroat and they don't care in a lot of cases and they're not reading anymore you know I think about this as a professor and now there's like chat GPS which can like write their papers for them and it's like yeah you really have to find like you have to keep that love of writing and letters and you know language alive and just hope that uh, people are going to continue to you know read and purchase and care about books absolutely yeah <laughs> no it's the most generous act I can think of for someone to read oh my god your work and oh my god. then I mean on top of it to tell you they enjoy it too which is like the oh ultimate god you know compliment but yeah and we heard it here everybody so if you want to write <laughs> vulnerable put your secret at the end of a book and publish it with an indie press yes well, it's go. like yeah. completely and then people the, then the very you know the the people who you know will like find my email on my website and write to me about reading my book they're always so apologetic like I'm so sorry I bothered you and in my mind I'm like I would like, except that it's weird. I would like literally like wallpaper my house with that. You know, like, I can't believe they're like, oh, so sorry, you know, about it. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like the fact that somebody that I, that isn't my family member. And actually like, I have lots of family members who do not buy my books. You know what I'm saying? Like, please. And friends. So like, I also have friends, like my, my one friend Miku in particular, who reads every single thing I write. And it's just like the, the sweetest thing, but you know, yeah, like when somebody reads your work and, and talks to you about it, I mean, it's got to be the most exciting thing in the world and never gets old, um, you yeah. know, and I feel like you'd have to be like, you know, 
like Stephen King for it to get old. I don't know who I was trying to think, you know, of somebody um, like, and I doubt Stephen King is completely over it, you know, because he's a writer. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And he's probably, I think I've heard he's kind of introverted and he still lives up there in Maine and oh. he probably enjoys his fan mail just as much as the rest yeah, of it's us. Like his connection with the outside world, but living in Maine does sound wonderful. <laughs> Just like having lived in the city my whole life, like every single person who lives outside of the city and like, I always picture them in like rolling cornfields, like, you know, <laughs> being poetic and having like a clear mind. And I don't know if it's true, but this is what I allow me my dreams. <laughs> yes, I will not. I was about to burst your bubble and I won't do that. Don't touch it. I won't don't touch it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, when I'm like 90, I'm going to move to Maine and, you know, kayak. I don't know if I can do that at 90, but it's my plan find someone else to kayak you around I'll kayak me around yeah. hopefully my kids will hopefully after all the patients that I have actually shown them they'll be willing to kayak me around at 90 there you go yeah, yeah you'll have that's my that. dream yeah they'll read me some books that kind of thing right. this seems like a good moment actually to hear some of your work if you'd like oh. to share something oh. with us well, all right. <laughs> if you insist. Um, if, I, if you insist. Um, so I do have the book Weird Girls. Um, I, we had this before when I was trying to show the cover and I like could not figure out how no, to do it. No, it's tricky. I'm um, going to also give you the full screen in a second. So I'm not going away. I'm just giving you the floor. The full screen. Thank you. Well, we I'll go. just read from the first page just a little bit. Just a little bit from Weird Girls. So the idea of Weird Girls, um, I was talking a little bit about it before, um, but it's this idea that you know, there's this concept of the art monster, the artist who gets to be, you know, completely dedicated to their work and how difficult that has been for women and how difficult that has been for mothers. Um, and so I set out to write this book that, that kind of addressed that. And this is the um, first two paragraphs of it. I slept with my childhood diary under my pillow, pink, self-serious, full of wild hope in my own words with a huge lock on it keep out world, but also break in. When I wrote in my diary about how the Wicked Witch of the West was a writer, I put her words in red because otherwise I couldn't tell them for my own. I told the world surrender, but it never did. I marvel that even so early in my little life, I had, striked, I had streaked my page, that white, supposedly innocent land with blood, it seems I'd caught myself being monstrous again. I didn't even intend it. It just happened. And I was helpless to hinder it. Um, and then I go into um, my childhood reading all about different monsters, how much I love the Wicked Witch of the West, how much I love Frankenstein, how much I loved all these monsters. And I guess, I guess one of the ideas of the book is just to say, okay, so a lot of women are using this term art monster and they're talking about it. Um, but I also wanted to think about why monster and not just why monster like, oh, monster like evil, bad thing, but why monster connected to this particular kind of creativity. Um, and so, and that's where I started getting these ideas about monsters are hybrid, you know, monsters live frequently outside of society, you know, often the moors, um, <laughs> don't have to think about pleasing everybody all day long, as I do, um, you know, don't have to think about the Tupperware. <laughs> um, and often monsters have, you know, some kind of amazing ability that kind of goes with their monstrosity. So, you know, whether it's the Sphinx and, and the Sphinx's knowledge or whatever it is of the witch's ability to make potions and magic, this kind of incredible creativity that's sort of unchecked and becomes almost violent or ferocious because it's just so not socialized. Um, and so I think about what we've been talking about, about how a mother's creativity in quotes, because again, like we don't have to be that kind of mother, right? But in theory, right? A mother's creativity is so domesticated. Um, and so I love this idea of women clinging to this idea of the art monster as a way of kind of like exploding themselves out of that. I love and so, that. and then I read a book about it, which I can never center on screen, but yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, art monster, I think, is also just such a great phrase. And I don't know if it was coined by Maggie Nelson or she just used it, but it's I know, such I've a been wonderful trying, term. I know, and I've been trying to like, of course, like I'm a scholar. So I've been like trying to like find that, you know, like where did this begin? And it's like, so Jenny Offill in 2016 in her book, Department of Speculation, like uses the term. Mm -hmm. And I can't, now obviously like art and monster exist before 
And I'm sure people, I'm sure somebody must have said art monster before. And I think the concept is ancient, right? So I'm not saying that Ginny Offill created the concept, but I wonder if she coined the term and I'm not totally sure. And I, I really would like read every book about it possible to find out exactly, because that's not one of the things I did. I did not declare who coined it in my book. That was not one of the, because it wasn't a scholarly book, right? To be clear. Um, but I have that like obsessive scholarly sort of mentality. And I was, I, I love your question. I know like who, you know, what was the first time that that was said in that way? Yeah. And I love that you're saying, and I, I agree that it must be such an ancient, um, idea or concept yeah. because surely these women who are represented in classic literature as waiting at home for the hero to return from his journey were in reality if they were real people yeah. ambitious and yes. had desires beyond the home and yeah. they um they were never sort of offered the pages to have their own hero's journey that's so right. I'm, I'm definitely, I'm really interested in those women who are sort of confined to the last chapter of a book, like Molly Bloom and Ulysses, yes. oh, right? my or God. the wife Don't in John Updike's Run or Rabbit Run, like these yes. women who are like, just, they they sort of are embedded in the narrative, yes. but and you just see like glimpses of them. Mm -hmm. Aren't they fascinating? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Just like we only get them by negative space. It's like, yes. they're there where the hero isn't. Yes. Yeah. Sort of holding space for him to return. It's incredible. And, but uh, exactly. And then at the same time, like in those ancient texts, there is like the murderous wife, you know, the witch, the monster. And I think, so it's like, she's there from the beginning, like these trouble, these problematic women, these tough women, these strong women, these difficult women, they're usually the villainous. Mm -hmm. which is why I've always like, so what's so funny is I'm very like, quote unquote, nice person. And I say, quote unquote, meaning like, I think I'm a truly kind person, but I also think people are like, oh, she's nice, you know, and, and whatever. But I've always in my art been interested in the villainous, yes. you know, it's like not in life. I want my friends to be very nice. I don't want, you know what I'm saying? Like in life, I can't like, please, I can't, you know, <laughs> like, no, you have to be a nice person. I can't deal with you if you're going to be but like, there's lots of very kind women who are incredibly intellectually complicated and fascinating. And that's who I want to be friends with, right? Like, that's my, that's what I'm looking for. But in fiction, I really like the villainous because I feel like that's usually where the complicated stuff goes, right? And it's like, often those men, I think, if you read those, like those, I mean, we all read those books because for a long time, that's all we were given in the canon. So we all read those books. And it was almost like, They'd put that like nice little woman who waited for them up, you know, with the with the dinner. And then they would put into the villainous of the story all the true aspects, maybe of that woman who waited up for with, you know, with the dinner. So it's like she, the realities of those women have always been there, but they've usually been channeled into the villainous, like the woman who that they didn't marry, the woman who's not in their home. You know, like we'll see her as like the hag in the market or whatever, but maybe like parts of their real wife are there. You know, so like, I think we've always had real stories of real women, but they've usually been in the villainous. Uh, and again, not that only real women are, are villain, villain like, but that, you know, I think a lot of the complicated factors about women have been put into these characters, you know, who do live off in the moors rather than in their home. Because what do you do with a complex woman in your home? Yep she's a pickle. You know what I mean? Like, how do you, <laughs> like, what do you even do with her? So absolutely. I'm completely fascinated by those women. Always have been, always will be. You just blew my mind a little bit with the idea <laughs> that these villainous women in some of these narratives are part of the hair, the, the wife who's waiting at home and live out her desires and ambition as yeah. monstrous. That yeah. is fascinating. and <laughs> So true. <Yeah. laughs> Well, now I like, yeah, now, now, now I think you and I should go off and like co-write a story about this. Yes, I know. <laughs> now I, I immediately I was like, I have to write that down. That's a great idea. Get your amulets together. Get yeah. your rocks and talismans. I'll get my murder board ready. We'll be ready I to go. I love it. I love it. We'll have a, a mixed CD yes. to listen I'm, to. I'm all about, you know I am. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Do you have a favorite um, villainess? Oh my God. There's so many. I mean, so one of them I mentioned, I love the Wicked Witch of the West. I actually, as a kid, before I got all like 
before I'd really read a lot, before I'd really like theorize anything, I loved Ursula and the Little Mermaid mm -hmm. um, because the Little Mermaid was so tiny in every way, right? Like metaphorically and physically. And Ursula was just bursting out of the confines of her drawn, of her drawn self. You know, she was just, she didn't even want to be, uh, you know, illustrated. She was just busting out of everything. And I just thought, I mean, obviously what she does in a literal sense, she's like a horrible woman, right? If she were real, I'd be like, no, thank you. Um, that's, that's just, you know, you, you need to be right. Like you're a criminal, but like in the, but in the fiction of it, you know, she was a magic maker and she was powerful mm -hmm. and her voice, you know, Pat Carroll sang her, you know, sang for her and and her like huge bosom and I just everything about her is like the opposite of this like tiny little mermaid who is like willing to give up her voice and willing to give up her legs uh, I mean sorry her fishtail fish and her fishtail you know it's just I don't want to give up my fishtail I don't want to give up my voice or her so, life even at the oh, end yeah oh my god yeah. yes yes so yeah. yeah I loved Ursula what about you you oh have a gosh. villain well, now that you say Ursula, I'm like, I have to show you if people can see. Yes, show me. I have a. Oh, a yes, see, um, it's hard to do. Oh my gosh, that's my so funny. It's not Ursula, but it is like that idea of um, I love the octopus, like the female octopus who lays her eggs and then yeah. dies. I, I've had oh my many God. women on the show talk about the octopus as sort of it's a so true. That's, that's insane that I'm talking about that and you have that tattoo. I have this, yes. Oh and in gosh. part because my daughter loved that character she when did. she saw Little Mermaid I for the feel first like, time. I feel like your daughter is going to be a, going to turn out very well then. It's a very I good indication. So. <laughs> I think so. But no, very I'm right there with you. Yeah, because she's, and again, uh, just in that film, it, anyway, you know, Ariel has these like beautiful songs and, and Ursula has the best song in yes. Disney history. Oh my God. Yes. So, but so um, good. yeah, I think other than that, the siren is my favorite, but not the mermaid. That's person. right. Well, that's right. The mermaid is like the siren. Well, it's kind of what we're talking about before. The mm -hmm. mermaid is the siren who's been defanged. Yes. You know what I mean? Like the yep. mermaid is like, if you look at the literature, like it was the siren, you know, that was what who we heard about. And like in Peter Pan too, you have the mermaids who are mm -hmm. like, you know, they kind of like pull Wendy into the, the river at some point or something like they, they, they always had that aspect in literature, but then mm -hmm. in the little mermaid, it's like, we completely took that away. Mm -hmm. Right. We were like, no. And we sold this to girls as like, if you want to be loved, you have to be like Ariel, you know, not like Ursula. Mm -hmm. And that really had a big impact on me. Not so much that I was like, oh, I want to be mean because that wasn't that's see, that's just simplistic view on her. But I wanted to be creative, you know, and Ariel in the beginning, she sings. She's a very good voice. She was actually a singer. Right. And she gave up her voice. So it wasn't just that she gave up her voice so she couldn't like chat. It's like she gave up literally her art. And I saw it and I was like, no, because one of the things my parents did give me is that, I mean, one of the many things was that they were like, they took me really seriously about when I was like, I'm a writer, you know, and like, oh my God, I was writing horrible, horrible things, you know, as like a whatever, however little child, but they took me seriously about that. And they were like, okay, sure, sure. Yeah. So to me, I was like, oh, well, this is what she loves. And she gives it up for a guy, which of course at that time I didn't understand. I still don't understand. I don't either. No, that that story drives me crazy um, it's, yeah. for so many reasons. But I think at its most basic level for what you said, that they defanged the powerful symbol of ferocity, of fierce yeah. femininity and turned her into this like, you know, pretty silent. Who, yeah, silent. pretty silent sort of her only ambition is to marry the prince and yeah. 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 And that's what we, that's what, what a lot of us grew up with, you know, totally. these sort of fairy tales. So yeah, problematic, yeah. problematic. We've done better, like Frozen, a lot of these things, like they've mm -hmm. tried to be like, you know, I mean, they're not perfect, but they've tried to address this at least, but we really grew up be even before that, like taking back happened. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So it, our childhood is just littered with these. <laughs> oh sort of like, I don't know how I didn't grow up thinking I was like pursuing like a prince, you know, yeah. Like, I don't know how I didn't fully internalize that because I like grew up and I was like, 
I, I actually had no plan to get married at all. Like that was never, in fact, I really thought I would never. Um, and then of course I ended up getting married like for, for New York, like young and before any of my friends. And it was, and obviously whatever I fell in love and what can you do? But I had no plans for that. That was like never my goal, you know? No, same. Yeah. Like, I was like, what? Yeah. Like I, I never look at my life sometimes. Or... <laughs> oh my God. I know. And I look at my life sometimes and I'm like, oh my God, what a, what a domestic, domesticated, I mean, at least from the outside, I know who I am, but it's like, oh my God, I'm like a married woman with two children. Like, how did this happen? Yes. You know? I think that a lot. And that's yeah. actually, I've said this on the show before, a big reason that I waited to have a child until I was geriatric, quote unquote, <laughs> was because I didn't want to be just a mom and just a wife. And yeah. So yeah. I've come to terms with the fact that there is no just there. Like those are both incredible um things to be and, and you can be a thousand other things too i think this yeah. idea that there's only you know what i mean like but mm -hmm. i thought that too i was like oh once you do that you can only do that or something and i was scared yes. of that yes me too yeah yeah i think this thought. is a good moment to hear a little bit more of your work if you'd like to sure, share. sure. yes yeah. so let me okay let me let me locate something that would make any sense um okay i'll read another little paragraph yes go okay. for it okay um so this one is um the next page and it's um it's explaining a little bit more about my childhood reading um and this whole process that I became interested in the monster like many weird kids I didn't have a television growing up but we did have movies to insert into the ancient VCR one of them was the Wizard of Oz even then I saw the need for a woman-made mythology, a man's world rewritten, rewritten by women, a wizard's world rewritten by witches. Most importantly, I saw that the Wicked Witch of the West was a writer, which is what I wanted to be more than anything. As Virginia Woolf knew, when, however, one reads of a witch being ducked, of a woman possessed by devils, of a wise woman selling herbs, we are on the track of a lost novelist, a suppressed poet, of some mute and inglorious Jane Austen, some Emily Bronte who dashed her brains out. That's a Virginia Woolf quote. In the movie Above Emerald City, the witch writes in black smoke with her broomstick, surrender Dorothy. When I read the book, I found that the witch of the North too was a writer. She took off her cap and balanced the point of, on the end of her nose while she counted one, two, three in a solemn voice. At once the cap changed to a slate on which was written in big white chalk marks, let Dorothy go to the city of emeralds. In this moment, I started seeing a connection between women, monsters, and creativity. And later I would add mothers to the mix. Um, and I guess this just leads into the part of the book where um, I think because I was a mother, it, it had already happened, right? This wasn't like it was, it was my life. I think I thought, well, you know, creating people is creative, right? You've created something. Um, creative, creating writing is creative. And let's think about those connections in this book. Um, because it was almost like, since I'm already here, <laughs> right? Like kind of <laughs> like, you know, like since this is already my life, and these are the two biggest parts of my life right now. And I don't want them to just eat each other up, right? Like I want them to coexist. Um, and so I think a big part of the book was thinking about, well, how does being an art monster feed my motherhood? And how does being a mother feed my art monsterhood? Because I think there's so much discussion. And guess what? It's the hardest thing in the world to make time for your writing. It's a, it's all the hardest thing in the world. But I know that I know that so well. And I've and I and I hear the sadness about that all the time. But I started wanting to hear how can it feed it? How am I a better writer because I'm a mother? How do I have more to write about? How do I understand feelings in this operatic way now? Because I've dealt with my kids range of everything. And maybe how is that fed my writing, you know, and how is being a writer fed my kids. And I, I use, I use this example or think about the first time they came to see me read, right. Which I think has still only been like one time. And they were just astounded. Like they couldn't believe that I was this other thing outside of the house, right. Like kind of like the heroine is like waiting home with dinner that I was this other 
thing. And of course they knew that I talk about it all the time. It's not like a secret, but they actually saw it in action. And ever since then, my son's been so interested in my life as a writer and so interested in my books and what am I writing about and wanting to hear parts of it that are appropriate, but not all of them are and wanting to share it. He writes, so his school, it's a public school, but they're incredible. Their writing program is incredible. They have him creating these books. They have publication parties. So it's like, he sees himself as doing this. And I see myself as doing this. And, and we actually have a lot of bond about it, you know, and I'm not saying he's going to be a writer. I'm not pushing him to do that. But I think he's like interested in in me as something more than just his mother, you know. I mean, <laughs> like he's interested in in having conversations that aren't just about Tupperware, you know. Um, and so we do. And I think that's one of the interesting things when you start to have older kids, right? Because it's like, of course, he's not interested in that when he's pre-verbal. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, of course, mm -hmm. we're not going to chat about books or ideas. But when they start getting older, and you're like oh, so we can have an intellectual relationship. Like how fascinating is that? So that's been another thing that I find really interesting um, lately. I love that. Yeah. And I agree. I mean, my daughter's six. She's, um, I think at the cusp of that, where we're starting to have these conversations that are just incredible. And I'm like, the way your mind is working and the things you're thinking about and um, and she also has been writing books and oh isn't it fun? I'm in these books. Oh my God, make, these schools are, yeah. Oh my God. They make no sense in like the best way. They're just completely, <laughs> she wrote a book that we um, got printed through Shutterfly and gave to our parents for Christmas. It was That's called, such a great idea. It was I really, I that. recommend I that. that. Yes. It's called the cupcake. What talked. And it's <laughs> just like these totally weird. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to purchase gonna that. It. Well, she asked me, she's like, mommy, when is my book coming out? And I was like, oh, oh you know, because she knew my so book she came out. So she's absorbing. She, see, she's they do. It. They absorb it. They, they absorb do. it. Yes. And we've talked before that. on the show about the, the example we're setting for our kids and that they're seeing yes. us working and as whole people. Yes. And I agree. I think that's just wonderful to offer that yeah. example to your children. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I really hope it's a good way of going because that's what I'm doing. I'm sure it is. <laughs> I hope so. So with the couple minutes we have left, I'm going to ask you if you have any final thoughts that you would share with writer mothers who are out there listening. Oh my gosh, such a big question. I mean, yeah, so I guess um, sort of continuing to believe in yourself as a writer, um, no matter what anybody says, <laughs> no matter what reviews you receive, um, no matter what, you know, strange comments people make to you when you say that you also write or when you say that, you know, especially like when you meet people in like mommy related things and sometimes they find out you write, they're like, Oh, you know, like whatever. Um, I would say to ferociously protect your writing time um, and your writing self and to ferociously believe in your writing self. And I, I think you have to believe in your own at least potential for genius one day. Um, and I know it sounds very overblown, but you know, one of the things I noticed from being a writing teacher is that sometimes a student will be like a perfectly good writer. And then five years later, they just, it's like their writing went through fire and they're just brilliant all of a sudden and something just happened in them. And maybe they had, they experienced great grief or maybe they experienced great happiness or maybe their brain change doesn't matter. Or maybe they went to a thousand craft classes or they read the right thing. But the thing is like, we all like, given like a baseline of like some writing talent, like just some very, very low level. I think that we all have that in us. And, and I think that it's really like believing in it and giving it the space to come out, um, surrounding yourself with people who also believe in that about you, I think actually. Um, and just filling your life as, as, as Lara was saying with like creative things, right? Like just create, creating a creative life for yourself. And, and the last thing I would say is, Think about building writing community and creative community and what you can give back as well. Like, don't be so like, oh, well, either I'm going to be famous or it's nothing. Like, be an editor, be a, be a writing teacher, um, you know, have a writing group, um, you know, go to the, it's like create a writing community where you're also giving a lot where you can really feel like a very, you're living a very vibrant literary life, even if you never, you know, become whatever writer it is who's alive, who you want to be, and you know you have that person in your mind, because we all do. And, you know, 
just build that beautiful writing community. Um, and I think that that can be enough. Um, that's what I have to tell myself, certainly. I think that's lovely. That's great <laughs> advice. <laughs> Thank you. I Thank hope you. it's helpful. It yes. definitely it's helpful to me. So hopefully it's helpful to Good. others. Yeah. I hope so. Hope and so. thank you so much, Caroline, for thank joining you. Us. This has been yeah. terrific. Thank you, Caroline. We'll see you again soon when the next book comes out. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us tonight as well. Um, if you have enjoyed the conversation as much as I have, um, you can consider becoming a patron or patroness to help keep the podcast going. Um, and you can watch this video and listen to the audio on writermothermonster.com or anywhere that you listen to your podcasts. Again, a special thanks to our sponsors and patrons whose support helps keep helps make this show possible. Thank you so much. And we'll see you again next time.